Are you a healthcare professional looking for a trusted concussion resource? Then you've come to the right place. From her New York City studios, welcome to Concussion Corner with your host, Dr. Jessica Schwartz. And now, a word from our sponsor. Did you know that sport helmets are rated on a five-star system similar to cars? And the safest helmets have nothing to do with price, brand, or availability? Since 2011, Virginia Tech researchers have been providing unbiased helmet ratings that allow consumers to make informed decisions when purchasing helmets. The helmet ratings are the culmination of over a decade of research identifying which helmets best reduce concussion risk. This work is done as part of Virginia Tech's service mission and is 100% independent of any funding or influence from helmet manufacturers. Our mission at Concussion Corner is to expose you, the listener, to trusted spaces in the concussion arena that translate to clinic next day. Please visit the Virginia Tech Helmet Lab website in our show notes or at bit.ly slash Virginia Tech Helmets and spread the word to aid in lowering concussion risk in your community. Thank you for tuning in and let's begin the show. Welcome to season four of Concussion Corner. My name is Dr. Jessica Schwartz, and I'm thrilled to have Dr. Jacqueline Cassis with us today. Dr. Cassis is an assistant professor in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at the Ohio State University College of Medicine and a member of Ohio State's Chronic Brain Injury Program. She completed her BSc in Bioengineering at the University of Pennsylvania and a master's and PhD in biomechanics and movement science at the University of Delaware. Her research focuses on understanding the short and long-term effects of contact sports participation and sport-related concussion with the overarching goals to inform public policy regarding youth sports participation and to improve outcomes in current and former athletes. Through her research, she aims to determine changes in sensory motor processing following concussion, the relationship between age of first exposure to contact sports participation and clinical outcomes, and interventions to prevent injury and to enhance recovery. Dr. Cassis has 31 peer-reviewed publications and has presented on these topics at regional, national, and international conferences. Jacqueline, welcome to the Concussion Corner podcast. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm happy to ha- be back and I'm happy to, to have you on. I was just you know, thinking uh, before we hopped on here this morning and I was like, wow, I, I think the last time that I actually saw you and I think is when I met you was actually 2014 in Boston, either at Harvard or MGH. I can't remember where we were. Yeah, it's been it's been quite a while. I think it might have been at Boston University, actually. So many schools oh, in Boston for yeah. sure. That is that is true. Actually, I think you are right. Um, and I, I just remember you were like in the midst of all of your education. I just remember, you know, essentially following you kind of step by step by step um, through social media and kind of seeing, you know, when your dissertation was finished and things like that and kind of cheering you on from a distance. So it's really nice to have you on you know, full circle. Yeah, things have come full circle. I think when we met, I just finished my master's um, and now I'm one year into my faculty position. So um, things are moving awesome. along at least. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. So, um, again, so, you know, we met in Boston, you were, you know, kind of in the, the Northeast for a while for most of your education. And, and then you ended up in Ohio. Um, how did you end up in Ohio and, and how long have you been there? And then tell me about your, your lab a bit. Yeah. So, um, I finished my PhD in 2016, uh, at the university of Delaware and then I did a postdoc, which ended up largely being at the University of Delaware as well. Um, I worked with John Jaca and um, really gained expertise in sensory motor processing and, and postural control. Um, and then I transitioned to Ohio State University. Um, so at Ohio State, um, we have a chronic brain injury program. Um, and Really, this is part of Ohio State's mission to to become like a global leader in in brain injury. Um, And so my uh, appointment is in the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. um, And then, you know, also as part of the Chronic Brain Injury Program. Um, And so 
Um, I am in the process of setting up my lab at Ohio State. It's been kind of a weird year to uh, get started with a faculty position. I think I was in my office for about two months when, when quarantine started. Um, so the lab is slowly uh, getting up and running, but um, I have a, um, a virtual reality system it's called the Immersive Labs. Um, so it's a virtual reality dome that surrounds a split belt instrumented treadmill. And so we can study, you know, all different aspects of how people use sensory information and especially visual information to balance while they're walking, while they're standing. Um, we could do dual task things. So it, it gives us a lot of options to study um, how people balance following brain injury. That's awesome. And, you know, I, I want to kind of highlight the kind of your journey, because um, for me, you know, I'm a clinician first and, um, you know, I'm a physical therapist and, and did some residency in orthopedics here in New, at NYU in New York City. Um, and that's all a clinical route. And your background is so interesting to me. Um, and I think probably to a lot of our listeners, you know, we're in over 40 countries, um, literally from Brazil to Myanmar to, you know, Italy and Canada and beyond. And, um, you know, I, I would love to highlight kind of your, your background, because again, if you're, you're starting with a bioengineering degree at UPenn, um, and then moving on to a master's and PhD in biomechanics and movement science. Um, why is that, you know, part of, why is that important for part of the journey to be, you know, part of the uh, stakeholder in concussion research? You know, why is your journey, um, you know, make sense for you? And, and how did you kind of end up in concussion research? Yeah, you know, it's very interesting, um, because I think, a lot of people I work with, um, even within our school of health and rehab sciences, they're they're mostly clinicians. Um, there are a few a few engineers, uh, which is always good. But um, during my uh, undergraduate degree, uh, I actually did a research internship down at Wake Forest. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Wake Forest has a center for injury biomechanics, um, and at the time. They were working on a few projects related to uh, brain injuries. And at the end of my time um, is when Joel Stitzel um, was beginning to use the HIT system in football players. Um, since then, you know, he and his team have really uh, covered the map in terms of youth soccer, uh, youth football, college football, uh, really recording biomechanics head impact biomechanics throughout, you know, a variety of sports. But at the time, um, they were just getting started with the HIT system. I had the opportunity to um, work on that project a little bit during my internship. And I just found it so fascinating. Um, and, you know, the football aspect was a little interesting, but as a former soccer player, I was like, well, wait a second, you know, when you're heading a soccer ball, there's gotta be pretty high head acceleration um, during that task as well. And so that's when I, um, you know, decided to do research and, and my master's and then my PhD. Um, and Tom Kaminsky was at the University of Delaware at the time, and he was just manually tracking soccer headers um, <laughs> using, you know, like a video observer uh, or an observer on the sidelines or, you know, video surveillance or a variety of different techniques, but more or less just counting headers. And so we started projects where we um, instrumented some of the women's soccer players, um, both in the lab and on the field, and you know, started studying um, head impact biomechanics in soccer players. And towards the end of my PhD, uh, started doing some balance things. Um, Tom Buckley at the University of Delaware also um, was kind of interested in, in gait and postural control. And I tied some of that into my work and found that very interesting. So that's why I went on then and did a postdoc that focused on balance, um, which was a great opportunity. So everything's been kind of related to, to biomechanics. And I think having an engineering degree just made that, um, you know, a very natural transition along the way. 
I know I, I in my undergrad at Ithaca College and doing an exercise science degree there and then my uh, doctorate for PT I, I think I needed an engineering degree just to get through biomechanics so um, I wish we could have been <laughs> friends back then because um, not my favorite class but again something that we use every day in the clinic in terms of you know thinking we you know as physios we think in lever arms for either gait or transfers um, you know or, or being more efficient on the field so um, very very cool to kind of hear your 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 upbringing. All right. Yeah, so, so um, let's kind of start with your most recent um, article here. Um, and that's and at least your, your published work, I should say, um, entitled Estimated Age of First Exposure to Contact Sports and ne Neurocognitive, Psychological and Physical Outcomes in Health uh, in NCAA Collegiate Athletes, a cohort study. Um, you know, you have a, a pretty impressive um, crew here uh, on the list of, uh, of co-authors with you from Grant Iverson to Thomas Kaminsky, you know, Kelsey Brick, who's actually going to be on the podcast this season as well, Steve Brolio, Mike McRae, you know, M McAllister Buckley at all, you know, with the Care Consortium investigators. Um, I'd love to hear about how you kind of um, even started the project and kind of, uh, you know, your experience with, um, with doing this. Yeah, so actually, you know, this whole series of work has a pretty um, funny backstory, which is that uh, in, oh, probably 2016, right around the time I graduated, um, Tom Buckley started teaching a class on, on concussions, and we were reviewing the literature. So each, each class, you had like three articles to review. And one of them, um, I don't even think I was presenting it, but one of the articles that caught my attention was Julie Stam's first article on um, age of first exposure and cognitive performance. I, I forget the exact title um, in NFL players. Uh, and I just thought it was such a fascinating area um, because you know, throughout my PhD, I was looking at youth high school and collegiate soccer heading. Um, and I was you know, a youth athlete myself um, and was just interested in, in the effects of head impacts and concussion at a very young age. Um, and at the time we were kind of in the process of starting up our care data collections. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, the Care Consortium is um, a group of 30 universities, including the four US service academies. Um, and uh, the, the PIs for that are, um, as you had indicated on the paper, Dr. Bilio, uh, Dr. McRae, Dr. McAllister, Dr. Pa Paul Pasquina. Um, and um, so in the process of collecting these data, I knew the data that we had available. We had baseline testing um, for all our athletes at the University of Delaware. And then of course the cohort of across the 30 universities. Um, and so, I said, well, we have a ton of football players. We can, we can replicate this study. We can you know, calculate their age of first exposure and then see if that relates to some of their baseline outcomes. And um, so, so we did that. So the first, the first paper in that series um, only included football players and um, you know, divided them into those who started before age 12 versus after age 12 to kind of replicate uh, Julie Stam's initial work. And in the um, in the college cohort, it it you know age of first exposure was not a significant factor, um, and so then we said, well, that's that's football. What about the other sports, right? So there's lacrosse, there's ice hockey. Um, we did a uh, some work with the service academies, which also have rugby, um, and so. Uh, there's been kind of this series of work coming out of the care consortium, looking at age of first exposure. And in a lot of these cases, we also have the ability to control for a number of other factors um, that, you know, may be more difficult to control in a smaller cohort. Um, things like mental health problems, um, neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, concussion history, you know, a variety of different factors that in a small cohort may be more challenging to control for. Um, and in all of these studies at the collegiate level, age of first exposure is, 
does not seem to be a factor, um, especially relative to uh, some things, you know, like the, the mental health disorders, um, increased symptom presentation. Um, and so, um, and just to yeah, interject, and just to interject there real quick, Jacqueline, sure. you know, again, so the end of the study was over 8,000 and you guys, you know, uh, refining your inclusion criteria knocked it down to about 2,000, less than that, at, at, you know, close to 6,400. Um, so this was not a small study. Um, so I can only imagine crunching this data was not only painful, but um, definitely required a village. <laughs> yeah, well, the nice thing too, is that we, we had enough uh, non-contact athletes too, that we could include a non-contact control group which I think also kind of strengthens the rigor of the study. Um, but, but it and certainly is working study. with the care data, working with the care data, we, it's certainly always uh, quite a large sample size. And I was curious to know, you know, um, uh, why you potentially chose some of your instrumentation. I know you guys use uh, impact testing, the brief symptom inventory and the best, the balance error scoring system. I was curious to why you went with those three. Yeah, so um, there are, the CARE Consortium has a number of um, baseline assessments. Um, those are what is considered level A assessments, meaning that all of the universities um, had to do them. Um, now, impact is a little bit different because you actually had a choice of neurocognitive assessments. It wasn't like impact was required, but by far the large majority of universities did use the impact. Um, so those were measures that we had uh, the greatest end for, right? Um, there are other um, things that are done through the CARE Consortium, like clinical reaction time, um, but there's three universities that do that. Um, there are some other neurocognitive tests, but you know, with each of those, only a handful of universities are doing each of those. Whereas for the impact, the best, the BSI 18, um, we, that was kind of consistent across the board. The only other one that is also consistent is the SAC, but since that's you know designed for sideline assessment, um, we didn't really expect to see any differences there. So that's that's one of the few that we left out, just because that tool is really designed for a different purpose. Right, and I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm glad to hear, have our listeners kind of hopefully lean in and take note of what Jacqueline just said is, you know, um, I, I think that's really important because when we even think of using the SCAT-5, which actually has the SAC included, um, you know, it's really meant for like a 48 to 72 hour, you know, sideline assessment and people are using them, you know, way beyond what that's uh, meant to be or uh, used for. So it's, I'm glad to hear that you kind of connect to, you know, the rationale of, you know, why, you know, omission, commission of certain certain tests. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's even one of the limitations of this study is that the, the assessment tools were selected for uh, concussion evaluation. So certainly I think there's the potential in the future to replicate in other cohorts using um, maybe some more sensitive like neurocognitive testing or neuroimaging. Um, but those were the, the tests that were available and in a large number. And so um, we went with those. Indeed. Um, and I really like the fact that obviously you included women. I mean, it sounds so silly in 2021. Um, but again, with the discussion of Title IX, you know, being even in your study and, and including, you know, 50% of the population um, in, in your study, I think is so important to connect to. Because again, a lot of these are, these studies are, have been traditionally focused. Um, again, the ends are so high, you know, for um, boys and men that play football. Um, and of course, the exposure of repetitive head injury, you know, in either uh, contact practices and games throughout their life. Um, but I am so glad to see that you've included, uh, you know, women in your study. And wh why was that? Um, did you just, is it, do you have to kind of advocate that because, you know, at, at any more at this point in 2021, or is it just, you have data right now with care and it's just easy to access? <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's really important for all of these studies to start, you know, examining women and, um, I think that that's one of the major strengths of the CARE Consortium is that it is such a large um, cohort of concussion in women that it's probably, actually, I can say almost 
undoubtedly it's the largest cohort of um, concussion in women to date. Um, so I think that having access to those data is really important. Um, and I know uh, Christina Master has been publishing some of those um, data as well. And I think it's really important. I do want to say, you know, that's one of the advantages too of examining age of first exposure continuously. Um, so 12 was selected initially. Um, and, um, you know, there are different neurodevelopmental timelines depending on, you know, what, what you're looking at. And those may differ in men and women. Um, and so I think that um, that's one of the limitations in using age 12 um, is that when you do start to look at other populations, like women, for example, um, the neurodevelopmental timelines may differ. So oh, that's interesting. Um, and that's why we chose to annualize, you know, analyze age of first exposure continuously. Interesting. Um, I, you know, I'm curious to know, actually, you know, uh, Actually, let me let me start doing a different question first, and I'll I'll, I'll follow up with that one. But um, for our listeners that may be new to some of this language in terms of age of first exposure and repetitive head injury, can you actually um, explain what those two things are, and obviously how they correlate, and why it's so important to look at this over time? Sure. So I probably should have started with that. Um, okay. So uh, age of first exposure, as as is typically defined is the age at which you begin participating in sport that involves repetitive head impacts. Um, and so um, the reason why that's interesting is because, um, you know, there's a lot of literature suggesting repetitive head impacts and concussion um, may have uh, short and long-term effects. And so um, these head impacts could theoretically occur during uh, periods of rapid neurodevelopment. And so the question is whether or not um, repetitive head impacts sustained during this time um, are, you know, more detrimental to brain health later in life. Um, and I think, you know, there have been a number of studies now that kind of in, in healthy collegiate athletes um, refute this association. Um, mm -hmm. studies that, you know, control for concussion history, but there's also um, emerging literature, even in former athletes, especially um, at the high school level um, that also um, do not support the association. Uh, and then a more, a larger cohort of NFL, I think um, there's a study with about 3,500 NFL players um, looking at later life brain health. Um, so there's still a lot of room to learn in this domain. Um, but I do think that the one thing that is important is to always control for concussion history in these analyses, um, because one thing that where we do see a significant association um, is in, in concussion. Um, so there does seem to be uh, essentially the individuals who start playing football before age 12 are are more likely to have a concussion history um, and, and you know, maybe even sustain more concussions throughout their lifetime. Um, so I do think that's important to address as well. Indeed, and I think the brilliance of the CARE Consortium is that, I mean, the, you guys are doing this work, uh, this deep work, um, is that you also can include controls. And, and again, I think that sounds crazy in 2021, but most of concussion um, literature historically has not included a control group. Um, so again, because we have this data available, and again, you guys were looking at, you know, uh, golf, rifle, rowing, crew, swimming, and tennis players, um, you know, to, to match control, um, this study I think was, is, I don't want to say brilliant, but it's brilliant in the sense of that it just helps validate some of the work that's, that's coming out of care. So I really give you guys kudos for including controls and, you know, in, in head injury studies. Yeah, I think it's really important, um, especially like in this study, there are so many positive, positive effects of youth sports participation. So we want to make sure that, you know, you have a control group so that you can understand what the effects of early participation in youth sports are um, compared to, you know, maybe the potentially negative effects um, of repetitive head impacts. Although again, in this study, there were no differences between groups, so. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And, and we'll talk about the, the, um, the conclusion in, in a minute. Um, you know, and I, I think that's important for our listeners to connect to Jacqueline is that we, we, again, are reading some of the studies that are coming out. And again, common sense says that hitting your head over and over is a bad thing. Um, we're not refuting right. that here today. Um, we'll talk about your 100%. Findings. Yes. Um, but also, we also want to make sure that we're not fear catastrophizing contact sports as well. If things are, uh, are done uh, mindfully and we pay attention to things like uh, contact and, and practices for little kids, um, you know, it was most likely unnecessary. I'm a big believer in and pusher of, you know, flag anything, you know, until a certain age, uh, under 14. Um, and things like that. So again, common sense says that hitting your head is a bad thing. Um, we, we know this. Um, understanding the benefits though of contact sports, I think is so important because again, I think in the media uh, and news and then you know, certain studies get highlighted and then again, you kind of blow up. Um, and that's the, the thing that people see. Again, on average, eight people read a white paper. We know that one of them is always your mom. Um, so if we <laughs> average that out to seven, um, it's important to talk about these studies. So I'm just curious, what did you guys find? And what do you think some of your limitations were um, in either instrumentation or you know anything along the way? Yeah, so I think it's important, um, again, to, to reiterate what you said, which is that there are so many benefits of team sports participation, um, you know, beyond like the teamwork and self-esteem and, you know, uh, things like that. It, it helps with physical activity. Um, right now, the, the rate of obesity, is, especially among youth is on the rise. Um, so we really need to be promoting sports participation, um, even at a young age, but, but really the key is finding out how to make it safe, right? So how to teach um, youth athletes to tackle correctly um, in, in terms of soccer heading, how to head the soccer ball properly, um, to make sure that uh, the game is fair. So like, you know, look at size, look at strength um, so that, you know, you, you're, you're balancing on those factors. Um, and then a huge point you brought up is making sure that youth athletes are supervised. So having athletic trainers on the sidelines um, or other healthcare professionals who can um, assess for individuals who may sustain a brain injury um, and, and making sure that those individuals have the ability to pull them from play, right? So that it's not the coach's decision, <clears throat> so that it's the healthcare provider, the athletic trainer on the sideline, who's making that call um, when they come out, when they return to play. Um, I think we can also have rule changes to try and make the game safer. Um, that includes concussion laws. Um, I think those have drastically improved. Um, I know that there's still room for improvement in terms of um, concussion laws, but I think that it's definitely been trending in the right direction. Um, same thing with improving equipment that includes helmets. Um, but the, I guess, you know, our findings from that paper really suggest that um, that age of first exposure was not a significant factor. Um, so we looked at age of first exposure and a variety of different outcomes, neurocognitive performance, psychological health, postural stability, um, and again, in both sexes, in men and women. Um, and uh, there just wasn't an association between early or age of first exposure and um, worse neurocognitive performance, greater psychological distress, or worse postural stability. Um, and in fact, the couple spurious findings that were significant were actually in the opposite direction, where earlier age of first exposure was actually better for, for some athletes. Um, so I, I completely agree that we need to make the game as safe as possible. Um, but again, you know, we need to, we need to find ways to keep athletes healthy while reducing their risk of brain injury. Um, I think you also asked about limitations. I mentioned this a, a bit earlier, which is that, you know, maybe these assessments weren't sensitive, sensitive enough to detect um, some of the more subtle deficits. I do think it would be interesting um, to have, you know, a more comprehensive battery of say neuropsychological testing. Um, I, alluded to in the beginning that we're setting up a virtual reality cave. So also looking at, you know, sensory motor processing 
and, and postural control, in addition to, you know, the best here, which was the, the test used for postural stability, mm -hmm. um, maybe having some, some neuroimaging, um, you know, se some of the more sensitive measures. But um, again, I think it, it is important to try and keep athletes active while, while minimizing the risk of, of brain injury. Indeed. Yeah. I would love to see, you know, just as a physio, um, I would love to see, like, obviously um, so many people are including the best in their studies, like people like yourself. Um, and I would love to also, you know, see folks including some kind of VOR, the vestibular ocular reflex testing, um, you know, which picks up, a, you know, rem we remember as clinicians, you know, uh, balances both top down and bottom up, looking at the vestibulospinal reflex with uh, the best and then the VOR with, you know, things like VOMS and other gaze stability uh, measures. So again, with your, with your work and postural control, I think that would be pretty neat to kind of see, um, you know, things like that added, um, from, for me, the, the, the reader, right. The, the one that's consuming. Yeah. I mean, data. so I completely agree. Um, you know, I guess we have to remember that the best was created, um, almost like we were talking more like a sideline assessment, right. Or like, a for, for, clinicians to use in a setting where you may have to, um, you may not have the resources for more advanced postural control tests, um, where you uh, may have to screen a lot of athletes and you don't, don't really have time for a comprehensive postural control assessment um, mm -hmm. or, or really sensory motor, you know, looking at, looking at vestibular function, looking at ocular motor function. Um, and so I, I think it's, uh, good for what it was designed for, um, but certainly it's not the end all be all of assessing uh, postural control, sensory motor processing, so on. So I do agree. Um, and, and, you know, in light of that, we also are looking at some eye movement stuff. So we will hopefully be able to have some of those VRR data and, and even like visual reaction time, things like that. Awesome. And, you know, for part two of our podcast, we're going to wrap up here for part one, Jacqueline, you know, we're going to, you know, talk about your sensory motor processing work and then also your dissertation on soccer heading biomechanics and neck strength. So I'm really looking forward to, to part two and kind of integrating all of the conversations that we've had already. So I, I think our listeners are, are going to benefit from all of the above and hopefully learn about new language and, and themes and topics that they haven't heard of. So I appreciate you coming on uh, for part one so far. Yeah, thank you so much. And I look forward to talking about those other topics in the future. Awesome. And then for, um, for folks that want to find you um, on social media or, you know, uh, clinically or, or to link up to do some research, um, what's the best way to find you either on social media professionally or um, at your lab? Yeah, so um, my Twitter handle is at Jacqueline Cassis. So it's J-A-C-L-Y-N underscore C-A-C-C-E-S-E. Um, that would be the best in terms of social media. Um, and then all of my contact information is available on my um, page through Ohio State. Um, awesome. And I'll, I'll so put all those links in the show Google notes. my name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. So it'll be all there in the show notes for folks. Um, and uh, yeah, well, thank you so much for coming on and, and uh, we'll get into uh, part two for folks. And um, again, it's Brain Injury Awareness Month for the month of March. So, um, you know, I really appreciate folks using, um, you know, bringing some awareness to closed head injuries like concussion and uh, MTBI and traumatic brain injury. So, um, you know, please, you know, share this podcast with a friend, a colleague. Um, we do a lot of work to try and push foam ed, free open access medical education. Um, so please, you know, share these, these links and resources with folks um, to kind of push um, your knowledge translation for clinic for next day knowledge translation in the clinic. So thank you for tuning in and we will see you uh, for the rest of season four. Have a great day. Thank you for listening to the Concussion Corner hosted by Dr. Jessica Schwartz. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and not to be used as personal medical advice. Don't forget to follow us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Concussion Corner.